you're listening to the Author Stories Podcast, bringing you the story behind the stories and the storytellers. If you enjoy the podcast and would like to support it, please go to patreon.com slash Hank Garner. Now, my interview with Stefan Boltz. Thanks so much, Hank. Um, it's nice to finally talk to you rather than chatting over Facebook. It's nice to hear. <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, and... Uh, you uh you have a, a a couple of books out uh right now that are uh generating some excitement. Uh tell us a little bit about how you got started writing and uh is this something that you've always pursued or is, is this something new for you and just tell us a little bit about how you got started. Um I think my first attempt on writing was I was 17 I read a lot of uh, Robert Ludlum and Born, Born Ultimatum and all that, Alistair McLean, when I was in my teens. And uh, I started to write a novel, like a military spy novel, when I was 17. I never finished it. Um, and it took about, my gosh, 20 years to start um, writing more, substantially more, you know, every day and and then another 10 years to, to start the first novel and finish it. So it was a very long process um, that uh, was always interrupted with life and job and family stuff and whatnot. But uh, it, it was always in the back of my mind. I always wanted to, I always felt like I wanted to write. And then I, uh, I came to the U.S. in 96, 97, and I went, I got my GED, went to college, and I had a writing professor there. She was really great, and she told me after I wrote some essay or something, she said, you have to write. And and that moment, I can trace back to that moment where I realized, you know, that's what I want to do, and that's what I really should do. And uh, that's kind of how it started to become more, more in the foreground of my life um, back then. Stefan, that that seems to be a recurring theme on this show. Uh, is, I know, is I know. That, uh, it seems like everyone that I talk to, uh, and and it really puts me at ease because uh, for years I thought that I was the crazy one that that walked <laughs> that was the frustrated writer that walked around with with these stories in my head that right, that I just right. wished one day I could get onto paper and actually right. share those with someone. Uh, so that yeah. that puts me at ease to to know that that yeah. and and everyone I talk to seems to have this similar uh, story. I agree. I I listened to I listened to uh, Chris Porto's um, your interview with him, and he has the same I think the same uh, constellation that he started young and then stopped and then got back into it and um, yeah I think it's kind of inside of us right and it wants to come out and at some point I think we're we're fed up with it not coming out and then we start doing it yeah do, do you think that there's uh mm. something uh innate in storytellers that just need to get their story out you know i i do i totally think that's the case i remember now that we're talking about it um i got a, a tape recorder in when i was in sixth grade and it was those old you know i mean now obviously you don't have them anymore but um you could you could record with a little microphone, and I remember I recorded audiobooks from scratch, just making them up, like stories into the recorder. And I was always Bruce Lee. Bruce Lee Naturally. was my hero. I could totally so, see that. Right, right. So I was, um, he was chased, and, and then I did sound effects, you know, with like, I was banging against buckets and, and, and p uh, like pots and pans and stuff like that, and, and uh, fights and storylines, just making up on the spot into the tape recorder. I really wish I would uh, get my hands on one of those, but I, I think they're gone. But th those were sort of the, the beginnings of the, uh, of the storytelling wanting to come out you know it's it was very early on i just realized that when we talked it's so funny <laughs> now uh you said uh, you talked a, a minute ago about coming to america uh you have an interesting accent you you are not uh, a native of this land N no i'm not yeah uh, i'm uh, where are you from i'm from germany originally and i came uh i was at a retreat in roscoe 
New York, which is a very small little fishing town in the Catskill, Catskill Mountains, about two hours from Manhattan. And uh, that was 96. And I met my now ex-wife there. And that's how I, I had no plans of staying here or anything. But, you know, we fell in love. And then I gave up my job and my apartment and everything in Germany. And I came here to live here. And um, that's how my journey in the States started. I always felt at home. It's weird. I I've land in Frankfurt on the airport and it's very clean and, and everything is neat and everything is in place. And I don't feel at home. And I land at JFK and it's dirty and it smells and, you know, the craziness. And I'm like, wow, this is my home. It's the weirdest, uh, weirdest thing. But what, what does that say you know? about you? I I don't know. I, I feel like I have to. I feel like really I have to be here. I, I was, uh, you know. Yeah, I I understand. I do. I know. That's, uh, and and when you find that place that's home, uh, it's it's a good feeling. It is. It's it's a very good feeling. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. So were you writing in uh, in Germany? Uh, you know, were you going through these uh, uh, these processes of of telling stories? Uh, was was coming to America a catalyst to to reinvigorate those things? Yes, 100%. Um, I did write a little bit in German, and my first attempt to a novel obviously was in German, but um, I cannot now, I cannot write in German for the life of me. There's no way that it, it doesn't have rhythm. I can't create any images. I'm, I'm missing words, the sentence structure. Uh, I can't do it. I I try to. I, I have this book, uh, um, the Three Feathers. It's a fable, and I try to translate it because I wrote it in German first. I try to translate it into English, and I failed absolutely miserably. The first page, I said I I can't do it. It's it would be, it would be horrifying for the reader, and it's it was very hard for me. So are the idioms different or uh, I, what's, you know, what is the... I don't know. I don't know. I, I love German poetry, uh, Schiller and Goethe and, and all those. I love it. And uh, But I can't, I, I, I don't know, my heart, when I write, I always feel like my characters have to, I have to, they have to carry me in a way, you know, their emotions have to carry me so I can write their story. And if I, if they don't carry me, then it's just dead writing. And in German, I can't get the emotion across. I cannot capture that emotional moment in the story when I write in German. It's, I don't know what it is. You talked about the three feathers uh, and uh, the fable. How yeah. did how did that story come about? <laughs> My God, um, it came out it came... <laughs> like like you know like like you can ask any writer where did that idea come from? Well, I don't know. Yeah, just, yeah, yeah. we have all those crazy. Of, it came from right. outer space. Where they all come from? Yeah, or or inner space or something. Or, or inner space, here, right? Um, basically, how it came about was the I was in a therapy session, and my therapist that I went to between like 2006 and 2010, 11, she has a sandbox in her office. And the sandbox is basically what you do is she has a whole shelf with figurines and you basically sit or stand in front of the shelves and you pick within like 30 seconds, you pick a bunch of figurines. They have like palm trees, helicopters, soldiers, uh, wooden trains and all everything you can possibly think of and you put them into the sandbox you arrange them without thinking about it and then afterwards you look at it with her and she, you know you can kind of see where you are who the other people are in your life and what's going on so it's a really good form of getting in touch with stuff that you're working on right but in this case it was absolutely made no sense whatsoever there was a rooster, a wolf, a warhorse, a uh, a dragon, and three feathers, a, a pegasus and three feathers on the other side of the sandbox, sort of in kind of like what I thought was a cave. And uh, I said, listen, I have no idea who I am in this story or who anybody is. It, it might make a nice little 
fairy tale, right? At one day, but I have no clue. And usually those sto- the sessions stay with me for a couple of days. Um, this one did not. I forgot about it right away. Um, I started working right after I came out of the therapy practice. I was on the phone and three, four days go by and I don't, I didn't think about it. And then uh, one morning I said, all right, let me just write down what happened because I always wrote down the sessions, what happened, like a little essay about what occurred. Um, and I started, uh, once upon a time, there was a rooster and I wrote chapter one and I'm like, hmm, <laughs> there is something strange going on. And, um, I didn't really think about it that much. Then I wrote chapter two, chapter three, and it was kind of like a nice writing exercise, but it didn't. Nothing happened, and I felt like I felt like Joshua in the story. He's all uh, alone and by himself, and he doesn't know where he's going and what's going on. And then something happens in the story that all of a sudden I was pulled in, and I felt like I have to write this down. I have to write this, how far it goes, um, whatever they tell me to write, I'll write it down. And mm-hmm. that was kind of... The further I get along in the story, the more this commitment on my side was uh, cemented that I would finish it. And on the other hand, the characters um, agreed as well in a weird way to say, we'll go with you. We we won't leave you uh, stranded. We'll go all the way to the end with you. But you have to write it down. So it was kind of a it was a very strange uh, and beautiful experience because I had no idea from one chapter to the next where it was going. I had no outline. I had no uh, no sense of a little bit. It started, I was always like one chapter ahead, but it was completely a mind-blowing experience for me because it was as if I would sit in the desert and discover with a little brush, discover a city under the sand. It was... Uh, Beautiful. It was a beautiful experience for me to write that. It was a gift, total gift. I have felt that way about uh, about stories as well, and they really are a gift. I, I and I talk to a lot of people about the craft of writing, and right, uh, and it, writing is one of those things that's part craft and part art. Uh, right. In that there are certain things you can do to develop your skill and your craft yeah. and mm-hmm. and then sometimes you just have to be at the right place at the right time with the right mindset right. to kind of receive the story as it comes yeah. and it yeah. sounds like the three feathers was one of those situations it was it was uh, 100% one of those i mean i did a lot of uh, technical um, not technical writing, but I did. I started out with writing screenplays, and I went to a lot of classes about dialogue and story structure and Joseph Campbell and Hero's Journey and um, all those things for years. I mean, I think I did that for like 10 years, um, very intensive uh, writing uh, in college and then outside of college classes. And I studied Aaron Sorkin from the West Wing and, and like really seriously studied this stuff. And then I stopped and I wrote some poetry and, and essays and stuff. And then all of a sudden the three feathers came out and it was almost like a, all that knowledge all of a sudden was brought to life, you know, in, in a story, which was, uh, it was awesome. It was a great is is the three feathers the story that that you've shared with classrooms? And, yes. And, yes. And I I've watched one of your YouTube videos and uh, you have a story where uh, you're opening an envelope and there are all of these cards that students have made you. Uh, tell us a little bit about that because I I was telling my wife that has to be one of the greatest experiences. Uh, ever. yeah. <laughs> It was, I think I went about to 15 different schools uh, in my surrounding area, and it's usually um, with the three feathers, uh, third and fourth grade is like the best 
uh, grades for that for the book. And I think this one was a third grade. And I knew the teacher from the karate dojo. Her son was in, in, in school. And so she invited me in and I and I now have all the figurines, all the characters as actual figures. So I have a, a rooster and a wolf and a war horse and, and, and all that set up. And I'm and I kind of show that to the kids while I read a little bit and talk about it. And they that class, that specific grade, third grade, they were just amazing. I mean, we had a discussion about the characters and and it was, you know, sometimes your your head goes out of the way and you you feel like you're in the zone with with somebody or with a group, right? And um I felt that with them and uh a week later I got this envelope from uh from Jennifer the teacher and she said he you know the students wrote you some cards and I was just blown away by the just the the thoughtfulness of them and what they they made little cover designs of the book and it was amazing i mean that's that's exactly why i wrote you know why i think we write is for that kind of a deeper experience with the reader you know book sales are one thing and reviews and and accolades are one thing uh yeah but the uh, the story that someone tells you that that your book or your story connected with them uh, is uh, there's nothing to compare to it. Right. No, it's 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 amazing. It's totally amazing. Uh, now, the three feathers. Uh, you wrote a companion book to that, uh, which yes. is something that uh, that you don't see very often. Tell us about the companion book that goes with the three feathers. Um, that is the scariest book for me to talk about because it's very very personal. Um, it. I wrote it because I realized while I wrote The Three Feathers that The Three Feathers is basically, you can see it as a fable, an adventure story, um, and then for kids. And then you also have an aspect of it that is a spiritual journey from the beginning to the end. And in The Three Feathers, Joshua, the rooster, our uh, hero, has a dream and basically what he realizes one day is that he thinks there must be more to life than the coop, or there must be more to myself than what I think I am. And that brings him to jump over the fence and start his adventure. And I always felt like when I came here from Germany, I was Joshua and I jumped over the fence because I didn't know what I expected or what to expect or what would happen. And I basically just dove into the water and started swimming somehow uh, and I was also also feel like I'm on a spiritual journey of some sorts. And so basically the the dawning of the true self, the companion, uh, goes parallel to Joshua's journey in the three feathers from the beginning, from this question, there must be more to life. And then he goes into, into he collects a couple of companions and then he goes into the darkness, you know, into the abyss and the underground and uh that's like our spiritual journey right so we it's not all uh fun and games you go into darker aspects of yourself and you look at stuff that you're like whoa you know where did that come from and like the dark night of the soul for example so he that journey joshua's journey goes through the inside the mountain the a lot of that is underground and in the darkness and stuff so i just felt like it was would be a good if somebody is on a spiritual journey, that would be, and he, they has, he or she has read The Three Feathers, it would be a good um, companion to kind of go step by step and see the Joshua's journey as a spiritual quest. Because basically every story, if you look at The Hobbit or Lord of the Rings or any, it's always a spiritual quest. You know, you're always more in the end than you were in the beginning. Right? Um, right. Right. Now, would you recommend that book uh, for? No, is, is that... I would not recommend it to anybody, <laughs> Hank. <laughs> I have not did, done any um, advertisement. I have one review. I have very little sales, and I'm very happy about it because I. It's a very personal book. You know, it's a lot of my own poetry is in there and stories and stuff. So I don't. Um, so. 
you can recommend it to people, <laughs> but I'm like, don't do it. But it seems to be a very uh, uh, special book to you that yes, that absolutely. has has meant, uh, and uh, I'm I'm very interested in it. I think I'm going to pick up a copy. <laughs> uh, <but laughs> I'll write your second review. Oh, uh, good. Yeah. The, uh, tell us about the fourth sage. Uh, this is a pretty exciting book. Um, yeah, the fourth sage. When I when I finished the three feathers. Um, the, I wrote the final scene during which I wept. I, I cried like uh, a baby through the last chapter, and I was finished. And there wasn't any plans for uh, a different story. Um, and I closed the book. And uh, for the next couple of days, I was kind of in a haze. And those a couple of lines were in my head, and they didn't leave me alone. And I started at one day, I said, you know what, I have to write them down because I have to just get them out of my system. And it basically, I wrote down the first paragraph of the first draft of the fourth sage. Um, Aries closes the book and she holds it in her hands for a little while longer. And I realized, oh my God, The Three Feathers is a book that the main character in the next book reads, and so basically she, the books are banned in the fourth stage. It's a dystopian society where books are completely banned, and um, there's no schools, no government, and, and all that. So she finds comfort in reading The Three Feathers, um, and I thought this would be an amazing ending for the fable that this girl closes the book, and then her adventure begins, the actual real adventure. And I gave it to a couple of uh, beta readers, but they said, you know what, it takes you out of the experience with the three feathers. It kind of negates what you have in the end of Joshua's journey. And I realized that that's true. So I left it alone and uh, I wrote the the other one, the Dawn of the F uh, True Self, and then the fourth sage came back to me. And that uh, developed into a really big... Uh, four-part series. The fourth stage is just the first one. And um, I don't really know. I, I have the same experience with that one than with The Three Feathers. I would had no idea uh, where the story was going. And I had doubts every day. I was I stopped writing every day and I said, I, I, first of all, ne nobody's ever going to read this. And th it makes no sense. And where is this going? Um until I was pretty much in the end, and then it hit me that uh, all my doubts were completely unnecessary. You know, it was it came out it came together really well in the end. Um, but I was doubting every day. It was the worst. It was like the opposite of the three feathers because I had to work really hard to keep writing because of my doubts about myself. When you were writing this book, well, and the three feathers, uh, you've talked about that it's uh, it was a discovery process the the whole time that you're chasing the story, uh, and and only knowing a little bit of it ahead of time. Did you know how the stories were going to end when you began writing them? Um, you know, in the fourth stage, I had an inkling of. The ending, a little bit of it, a tiny, tiny, I had just a, an image, an image with an emotion attached to it. That was basically it. And, um, but I didn't know the exact way it would end. Neither did I know how they would get to that point. Um, so I didn't, I did not have a, a, a clear understanding of what was, would happen. It, I was very surprised. Um, that it ended that way, and I it was such a relief <laughs> to realize that oh my god, I did not write myself into a corner from which I would never recover after you know 120,000 words, I would be crushed, right? I mean, you would be completely uh, devastated. And it was the, the, the biggest relief to realize, oh, my God, all those little threads that I thought, why are they there and what's going on with them in the end, like, were all coming together. And I was like, whoo, <laughs> <"Ooh>, yeah. <laughs> how, 
How long did it take you to write The Fourth Sage? Um, I think it was about a year, and it was two NaNoWriMo's. One was in uh, April, and then one was in uh, November, and then a bunch more, and then some editing process. So it was from the first paragraph to the last editing was probably about 15 months, but I wrote two books in between. So it was kind of like... Uh, not completely on one, you know, in one stretch. Uh, it was more like a little bit here and there, and then and then a big stretch of like five, six month, months of only writing the fourth stage and then letting it sit. I, I always need to like percolate like a coffee maker. I, right? I can't be like Hugh Howey that in, in like a week or two, he bangs out the whole book. It's crazy. I'm, I'm like, how can you possibly... It's amazing. I'm, I'm in awe, but I can't do it. Um, as you're writing this this big story and and you're just kind of uh, discovering it as you go, uh, are you learning things about the writing process as you go? Uh, or does it amaze you each time uh, that the story comes out? Uh, and and are you are you still refining your process as you write? Well. Listen, I feel basically like a kid in a candy store, or a better metaphor would be a a fantasy geek in a fantasy bookstore. And you you, you read like this, your favorite, favorite fantasy story, and you're like, holy shit, really? This is what's happening? So that's how I felt. I was like, oh my God, this is really happening. You know, like a discovery that the characters make, and... I'm I'm I feel like I'm a, a reader of a fantasy book and I'm reading as I write it and I discover all those things uh but I, I don't edit when I write I write I edit after but I I don't go back until I'm completely done and then I go back and start all over with the second draft or something but I don't uh, I don't edit while I go and it's very freeing because I, I'm like, oh, I'm not going to worry about it. If it's garbage, I'm just going to throw it out. You know, it's done. Move on to the next scene. So this is a little bit of a freeing process for me. I was going to ask you about that editing process because uh, I'm one of those writers. I have to turn off spell check and, and everything right. <laughs> uh, because I'll, you know, I'll be typing and I'll look up and I'll see the squiggly line and. And then, you know, an hour and a half later, I'm, you know, off on a tangent, you know. Somewhere. Right, 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 right. exactly. <laughs> it's, it's crazy. Uh, right. But uh, so you said that then you go for a second draft. Or, are you a uh, a rewriter or are you uh, an editor as you go back I, to that second I'm draft? Not, I'm not a rewriter. I can't possibly. I did some uh, minor corrections in the fourth stage that uh, – I had to just kind of um, change the structure a little bit, but the basic the basic structure was there, and I don't think I would be able to like for example, if somebody would say the love interest has to come in in the second paragraph, and now not in the tenth paragraph and, and in the second chapter, not in the tenth chapter, I'm like I I can't do it. I I would have to rewrite the whole the whole thing and it was flowing you know from one to the next and building upon each other i would not be able to do that so i hope i'm never in the uh situation where i have to do major structural rewrites because i don't think i would be uh able to do it well the fourth sage uh right now has a 4.9 out of five star rating on amazon so, That's crazy, uh, yeah. Yeah, and and someone is is loving what you're doing. So I, yeah. you know, as and we I'm, say I'm, as we I'm, say I'm, in the South, uh, if the biscuits are good, don't change the recipe. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> Listen, it's it's hard. I I I um, catch myself because I was uh, starting to write the the prequel uh, the sequel to it, and I'm I'm starting to catch myself saying. Oh, you know, it's never going to be as good as the previous one. And this time you're really going to fail. I mean, last time you just thought you failed and you didn't. But this time you really will fail, you know. So don't even start writing. I'm I'm in the same uh, same process now than I was uh, 
before a little less, but it's still it's still there. And maybe that's a healthy thing to have the doubt, but it's excruciating at points, you know. That's a very good point that you brought up because I think a lot of people look at authors, uh, especially authors that have found some success and that write stories that connect with people and everything seems to be just you know going wonderfully in their lives and in their career and with their art uh but what most people don't see uh, are those times that we sit at the keyboard and stare at the blinking (laughs) cursor on the screen and either have no idea what to say or are terrified to say what we really want to say or we're just terrified that no one cares what do you do to to wrestle with those emotions um, I have one, I had one incident uh, in the fourth stage. The the main character is Aries. She's a 15 year old girl, and um, one day I was complaining. I don't know if I was talking to myself, but I was at least thinking uh, that I'm. It's not working. I I don't know where it's going. What's going on? And I heard <laughs> I heard her voice in my head. She used the F word, which I'm not going to use right now. But she said, just write down my goddamn freaking story and don't worry about anything else. And that kind of like bounced me out of my misery. And I'm like, okay, okay, I got it. I got it. (laughs) Okay. okay. Sorry, sorry. You know, (laughs) and she's like, don't be sorry. Just write it. But um, she was, she's very feisty and um, I... I have to, it's weird, you know, because it's almost like a little psychotic because you are, there is nobody. It's all you. There there are no characters, right? So I'm talking to my characters and I say, oh, yeah, they helped me through the process and whatever. Um, I guess they're all parts of me, but it's sometimes I I kind of look at myself from outside And I'm like, so you're talking to your character and you feel like your character is talking back to you. And, you know, maybe you want to think about that for a little bit. (laughs) But anyway, I guess as a writer, that's what you do. Absolutely. You know, Uh, would you have any advice for someone who uh, maybe is starting out or wanting to write, but really doesn't believe that they have what it takes to tell a compelling story what would you tell someone in that situation well you know the thing is i i not because i was in schools and stuff i get that question um a a lot and my my approach is and that might not be anybody else's approach but my approach is right from the heart do not write from your head or try to just write and write from your heart see what emotions come up and Go with that. Stay with the emotion of the character and follow that emotion. Where does it go? Is it either if it's sadness, become you, you might become sad, but or if you if it's excitement, you become excited. But try to stay with an emotion and let the rest be pulled by it. It's almost like a locomotive that pulls the train, and the emotion is the the the, the fuel that fuels the whole thing. Um, so that would be my advice. Don't don't worry about uh, grammar or just write what makes you feel something. And that's if I think if you feel it, your reader will feel it too. If you don't feel it, your reader is not going to feel it either. Um, that that's my advice. Um, your website, the three feathers dot com. Uh, at the top, you've got a a blurb that says "Stories of Hope and Splendor." And sci-fi. <laughs> what, what's right. that about? <laughs> well, listen, I wanted to make myself write a mission statement. I'm like, okay, why am I writing? You know, I was thinking about that a lot for, for at least 10 years. So why am I writing? What's my purpose uh, in life or in uh, in my writing? And I realized that I think it was Will uh, Swartstrom. He reviewed The Three Feathers and he said, you know, it's there. Your stories are always so hopeful, and I and I feel like this is that's it. You know, I want to write stories that are hopeful, even though they are dire and they're dangerous situations and uh, 
all that, but the the end or the 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 thread that weaves through it should be hope, and so that's why I thought um, hope would be one word. And the second one, you know, being from Germany, I don't know all the words exactly what they mean. I just love the word splendor, and. And and I looked it up, and I feel like okay, so it's kind of like magnificence and um, like uh, not richness in in material things, but rich in in maybe emotional things or spiritual things. And I feel like the splendor is not so much outside, but it's inside. You know, so you I tell stories of hope and the splendor, and I think my basic thought is that we all have so much more inside us than we possibly could ever think about. We, I think our view of ourselves is one hundredth of what we could really do. And that hope of discovering that, you know, that we are more than what we think we are, and the, splen- the inner splendor that we kind of discover or the characters discover, um, that's I think that's why uh, I write, and I thank you for asking me because now I'm kind of, for the first time, formulated it officially, <laughs> uh, except for those three words on my website. So uh, that was good. I loved it when I first saw it because uh, I, I've really been wrestling with with some things in the last few months and about uh, some of the stories that I want to write and and trying to kind of plan out future projects and things like that and and there's there always seems to be a thread woven through all of the stories that i tell and i i think for me it it comes back to my love of epic fantasy and things when i was growing up and and then you get to thinking well what is it that i love about those stories well they're ultimately very hopeful and And they're kind of magnificent and, and right. full of splendor. And when I saw that, I was like, you know, I think he thinks exactly the way I do about it. And you know, it was it was a I felt a, a kinship there. About yes, that. I and I, I, Hank, I have to tell you, um, when I read um, the the story about the uh, the psychic, oh, the witching hour, the witching hour. Yeah. Um, uh, first of all, I read the witching hour by Anne Rice uh, about fifteen years ago, which is a completely awesome book and completely different but I uh, when I read it I felt like hmm this is something I would write like like the the twist and like ooh, let's let's look at it from a completely different angle and um, so I felt this the same thing I felt this kinship like oh there's uh, you know there's some similarities in thinking and uh, in how to approach a story a little bit that was that was awesome that's great. Uh, what what's coming up next from you? What's the the next project on the horizon that you're um, that you're wrestling with right now? Um, I have two things in in production. One is the Fourth Sage Revelations, which is the direct um, sequel to the three uh, the the Fourth Sage. Um, now, now you said but, that's going to be a four part series. Ultimately, um, is that well, right? it's it's it is the whole thing is going to be a five parts. And the three feathers is the fifth part. Um, it's if you, um, I, if you, do you know the Escher paintings? It's this, right? So you, yes. So basically, you think you're going up the stairs and you're going down, and you always end up at the same point, uh, right? So it's like an endless a circle. Um, and I have the, the Circularity Saga, which is the fourth sage, um, the first book of. I realized that I'm those five. Um, it's five books. The stories are some of them are a thousand years apart. But what will happen is, at one point, because you go um, in time, you go forward. But at one point, the reader will hopefully realize, and I hope I can pull it off, that all of a sudden they are pre-beginning of the story. And all of a sudden, wait a minute, how did this happen that I'm now at the beginning of the story again and the whole thing starts over? It's a circular um, 
that it, that excites me so much. I just it's like, I geek out over that entire <laughs> idea. That's, I, I cannot wait for you to finish. I that. love this. It's yeah. like so cool. Was, when I when I realized that that's what what was happening, I was like, oh my god, it's a circle. It's like time isn't you know. It's it starts all over again. And, like and you stand that, up at your desk and you do a little happy dance because oh you're my like, god, yes, I'm not it. kidding. Yeah, I've kidding. never done like, that ever. Oh yeah. sure. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Like in uh, Battlestar, Battlestar Galactica, the new – I don't know if you watched the new ones, the uh, the new Battlestar. Yeah. Um, when they say towards the end of the season when it really got like loaded with stuff, you know, they say it happened again. It happened before and it happens again and again and again and again. And it's like history repeating itself uh, in a circular fashion. So that was kind of uh, – it's so cool. Yeah, Absolutely. Do, do you have a favorite book that you go back and reread from time to time? Um, yes, I do. I have uh, two of them. One is a, a kind of a spiritual work that's called A Course in Miracles. I've uh, worked with it for like 25 years. Um, and the, that's the my nonfiction. And then the fiction is my absolutely favorite uh, book of all times is The Assassin's Apprentice by Robin Hobb. Um, it's a tr- book. Oh my god! I I bought the rights for the movie from her. Really? Fifteen years ago, and I wrote the screenplay. I, I adapted the story, and I I pushed it on, you know, with some producers and stuff. It never worked out, but it was the most amazing uh, thing to realize. Oh my god! I just bought the rights to my favorite. Sci-fi sto- uh, uh, fantasy story. It was like the coolest, geekiest moment of my life. I think. <laughs> so did did anything come of that? No, it never never did. We only had the rights for eighteen months, and we were we were fresh. We had no clue about the industry, and we wrote the screenplay, which was horrible. You know, we should never have written the screenplay. And I met through but, another. Screen- but that was an amazing experience, was it? It not? was amazing. Yeah. I I mean, I talked to the guy that that discovered the Matrix people, uh, Lawrence Mattis, and on the phone. Uh, <laughs> and I, I went to uh, Seattle to meet with Robin Hobb. We had dinner with her. It was awesome. I mean, it was, you know, that was that was the coolest experience, even though nothing happened. But it's one of those things where you have to just do it. And Now, was that before, after, or during the time that you're writing novels? Uh, that was way before. That was in that was 1999 and 2000 when I uh, wrote screenplays mostly, and started my writing more seriously. But it was all screenplays back then. Yeah. Did did uh, did that experience inform your uh, novel writing? Yes, totally. Because you in in screenplay you have to write in visual images, and I think that's what I learned to to write in visual images that I can totally uh, capture the the scene that's building in front of me. And it has to be very tidy and tight. You can't just say, you know, he walks down the street and blah, blah, blah. It has to be one page per minute, you know, 120 pages to our movie. So it has to be really tight. Um, it's a good exercise. Um, you had... Uh you had some good news recently. Some congratulations are in order, are they not? <laughs> yeah. Yes, yeah. they are. Yeah. What, what's going yeah, on? Yeah. Um, my my now fiance, um, my ex girlfriend. Um, she were getting married. Um, we we're together for five years, and um, I asked her to marry me on Saturday, and she said yes. So we're very very happy. Um, she has been an amazing, uh, just an amazing support for my writing, which is so helpful because I, you know, because of all the doubt and everything that's involved, as you know, um, it's really, really good to have somebody that says, go for it, you know. Well, congratulations. Uh, thank you. I hope you, um, uh, much success and 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 happiness in that and and there really is nothing like having someone who 
uh, stands beside you and is yeah. a constant encouragement. Uh, right. I tell you what, it, if if it weren't for my wife, uh, I don't know what what I would have done. And well, I know I never would have published anything. Right. Uh, you know, yep. without that gentle encouragement, and uh, it's it really makes a huge difference. Right. It I does. Uh, I so, uh, where can people find you uh, online, Stefan? Um, I think the best way is I have a Facebook author page now. So if you look for Stefan Boltz, you should find me. And the 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 three feathers dot com is my basic blog that has every all the books and and uh, blog stuff and um, some events and future stuff coming up and whatnot all on it. So the the three feathers dot com is probably the best um, the best way. And then if you come to upstate New York. You know, write me an email. We'll have coffee or whatever. We'll meet anytime. Awesome. <laughs> uh, you, you also have a YouTube channel uh, that you're doing some some really cool stuff uh, <laughs> on your YouTube channel, and you might even see a chicken dance. I, I'm not. I, <laughs> I'm not endorsing yeah, that. I'm not uh, not saying that that <clears throat> it is or is not there, but it could. If you go look at his YouTube channel, there might be a chicken dance. Just saying. <laughs> But uh, uh, you also are doing something really cool on your YouTube channel, and you are reading um, some of your books on there. That That is an excellent way for people to get a taste, if you will, of some of your work and to actually hear it straight from the author. And uh, I, I love uh, hearing you narrate some of the scenes and, and really getting into the, the dialogue and stuff. It's It's really cool. It came out of the kids because I thought, you know, the kids don't. You, as a as a third, fourth grader or fifth grader, you can't buy an audiobook, or you might not be able to get one, or you might not even be able to read the book because it's, you know, whatever. But you can always go on YouTube and, uh, you know, you can play in the room and listen to it. Um, it's like a little bit of an audiobook just read by me, and it it, it was so much fun to do. Um, so just enjoy it. It's the enjoyment excellent and we'll be sure to uh link up all of your work in the show notes uh to the show and stefan this has been uh a very quick interview uh the time has just flown by oh my and, goodness yeah and i want to thank you for taking time out and um maybe one day we'll tell the story of of all the ways that we uh tried to connect and yeah, technology got in our way, but um, yeah, yeah, the Wi-Fi apocalypse. You know. <laughs> that's right, that's right. But uh, thank you so much for coming on, and uh, and I appreciate it, and uh, wish you much success in your writing and uh, in your upcoming marriage. Thank you so much, Hank, and the same to you with everything.